Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theater Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. You all know I have an affinity for new musicals. And when the first line of a synopsis is, meeting an elephant can change a man's life, how can you not want to know more? Today, we're going to learn more about The Circus in Winter with composer and lyricist Ben Clark. Ben, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. No problem. So I always get like to get to know my guests uh, a little bit better before we start. So I always ask for a 30 second bio. So who is Ben in 30 seconds? Um, always trying to write something every day, probably always has his eye on a, on a, uh, you know, sports game of some, some kind, uh, big, big jogger. Um, and always listen to, to music somebody else has, has made. That's kind of my, I'd say that's my steady rotation of, uh, of things. Nice. So yeah. when, when you were growing up, were you always into musical theater or music or theater at all? Or were you, uh, you know, did you have some other passions and you discovered it a little bit later in life? Yeah, I think, I think compared to most, I was, I was a little bit of a late bloomer in the, in uh, the theater aspect of things. I musically, I started like, um, playing violin when I was in the fourth grade. So that was my first instrument. And um, then by 12, I had picked up a guitar and, and by 14, I started like writing, um, not really like with the intention to write, but it just like kind of the song happened one day and, and um, we kind of kept rolling from there. And um, uh, I mean, I like, I mean, I, I'm a big sports fan. Um, I really, I really like the um, collaboration of, of people working together in, in sports and stuff. So, I mean, you know, when, uh, when I kind of realized I wasn't going to be tall enough to hit the NBA, uh, I think I, I think I kind of, you know, got realistic about that, but then music popped up and um, I found that same kind of collaborative element um, when I started going out for musicals and then stuff like that. And uh they had no idea I could really sing or anything like that until probably, you know, my freshman or sophomore year in high school when, uh, you know, my choir teacher was kind of like, why haven't you come in yet? And I was like, I didn't know it was any good. I didn't know I could carry a tune or anything like that. But, um, you know, and it's kind of, it's kind of gone from there. It's, it's always been so fun to, uh, you know, shake hands with people and then get into to making something with them. And that's, you know, whether you're, uh, on the acting side of things or the creative side of things like I am most of the time now, uh, you know, it's, it's just can, couldn't ask for a better job. I'm always curious. Um, you obviously ended up in the arts, but was there any other profession that you were kind of leaning towards when you were growing up or in high school that you thought maybe I could do this? Um, may, maybe sports commentary, like being an announcer for a huh. game that was, that was something I always liked. Uh, still, still something like I, I really, when I'm watching sports, you know, I, I'm always like, I have my, my favorite commentators and stuff. You know, the people who like, even if it's a dull game, can like really yeah. bring it to life and and uh, show you where to look and things like that. Um, so for a while, I thought about doing that because uh, I am kind of an encyclopedia on on those things. But um, but I mean, in in all actuality, I think I, I think by 14 or 15, I knew where my, where my heart lay. Um, and that was in like, you know, riding and singing, performing and things like that. So which sport, that's the question, which sport would you have wanted uh, to do commentary for? It's changed. It's changed a lot over time. It's like, I think basketball was my first language coming from like Southern Indiana. I'm, I'm from like 10 minutes outside of Louisville, Kentucky. And so like, there's a lot of like, you know, Indiana Hoosiers kind of yeah. vibes going on. And, um, and so, I mean, that was first, but then, I mean, started really getting to the NFL um, as I got older. And then, like, late high school, I watched the World Cup. And now I think probably my, my number one sport is I just watch soccer, like, religiously. Just that, that if it's on, I'm, I'm watching a big Manchester United fan. And uh, so, I mean, that's, that's probably my number one at this point. All right. See, yeah. I, I have no problem going off on a bit of a tangent. I get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, a little bit yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so did you go after high school? Did you go somewhere for the arts? Um, I did. Yeah, yeah. I got into uh, Ball State University, um, class of 2011. 
um, in uh, musical theater performance, you know, the, the whole acting and uh, dancing and, and singing track. And um, that was a great education. I mean, I had a, I felt like I had a really good college experience. And um, that was the place where like when I was a junior, uh, they had like an immersive track for, for um, you know, just a, a teacher could pick a project and then for a whole semester, a, a group of students would work on that project in lieu of like taking, you know, uh, normal classes and stuff like that. So that is kind of where I got started writing the circus in winter. Um, somebody had, you know, it's an author from Indiana. We were a school in Indiana and the story was in Indiana and stuff. And uh, so somebody picked that up and, you know, I was lucky enough to kind of, um, find my stride in uh, writing for theater, which I hadn't done before. I'd, I'd written kind of like pop songs, I guess, um, before that. But, you know, I had a teacher that, that thought that I could do it enough to tap me and give me a shot. And uh, I, you know, found a little bit of success and that's guided me into the real world. Well, let's talk about the circus in winter. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the synopsis beyond what the one sentence I gave? Well, it's in a, it's in a um, kind of a, I mean, you just live your whole life in, in quote, in development, you know? Um, so we've gone through a lot of different iterations. The, the novel it's based on is a um, kind of a series of vignettes, small stories that, that occur over like a, a period of a hundred years maybe. Um, and so it's always kind of been a challenge with this show to take this story about all these people who are basically from the same place who all cross paths through the idea of this circus that existed, which is based on a real circus. And for us, I mean, it's always been about like, what chunk of the book do we want to take and make our musical about? And so at this point, we're kind of taking two or three chapters and, and using that as a flashback point um, for a story about someone who's from Indiana, who's never really been in love with their their hometown and who's never really explored like their family or where they come from and why they're even there and um that kind of intersects with the past um but the main story in the past is like you said at the beginning i mean that uh, you know a man meets an elephant that changes his life is kind of like a um about about a man who um I guess in trying to save his marriage, like comes across a rundown circus and then purchases it for his for his wife, and and uh, it changes their their life together. I always I'm always curious because um, you said it was based on a novel, and I've talked with other artists. Did you have a, was it an easy time getting the rights to the novel, or was it a difficult time? And, and is there you know I'd love to hear your experience. Uh, I mean, in in regards to um, I mean, always if you you know when you're getting a uh, source material and stuff. I mean, there's always usually like this moment where uh, you have to, you know, get the rights or shell out some money and stuff. And we've been really graced by um, the generosity of the author, Kathy Day. She just um, thought the idea was great from the start and, and really has given us license to, um, to pursue it. And also um, kind of, and this is the biggest one for me, like if, if we need to alter anything for the purpose of just our format being different than the long form version of a, of a novel, you know, like it's, it's two hour musical, you know, so like sometimes you need to, you need to jump or skip or cut or something like that or change, you know, the way people are combined characters. And she's always been um, really gracious with them, um, you know, not being too attached to uh, the way she did things and she did things really well. So we're, we're lucky in that regard, but, um, and in, in, in the creative aspect of it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's been, it's been a long, long thing. And like it, it's, you kind of get into this, this space sometimes with writing things where it's like, if it goes for a certain amount of time, um, the world changes and then your, your, your piece changes too. And I think over these last two years, we've, we've gone through a lot of that. For sure, for sure. No, I understand. You wrote the the music and lyrics to this, and uh, mm -hmm. you had partners to write the book. Uh, I'd love to learn a little bit about them. But uh, was it an easy process for you to start working with somebody else, or or 
and I don't mean just them in general. I mean, just yeah, yeah. working with somebody else. Um, it's, I mean, well, the first thing was like kind of, a, I mean, when we were literally in class doing the thing, like, I mean, that was like, you know, 15 or 16 kids all together, like, who are, you know, we knew what we were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. It was a lot of a first time. I mean, me included, like writing, writing songs. I mean, like, uh, I have now, you know, all these Dropbox folders of like the show over time, you know, just in case you, you know, you want to pull something, you yeah. cut it back. And I mean, yeah, I mean, on my part, they're just some stinkers in there, you know, from the very <laughs> beginning, we're like, you're just, just like, we need a song that does this and you get it out. And it's, yeah. you know, there are some times where you go into a reading or something where you're like, this song is not going to stay around, but it just has to be there right now. Um, and then, you know, you find, you, you find the, the one that really fits over time. But um, yeah, in that regard, I mean, it, I would come into class and um, having written something and just have to like play it right away, just like staring at the staring at the paper. And then, you know, I'd be evaluated, you know, by my classmates and we'd all have an open discussion. So, I mean, that was a pretty great trial by fire for me, you know, because um, I, I think I've gotten better at better at, um, you know, just the idea of criticism or whatever you want to call it. Or, um, cause for a minute there, it wasn't, I took it personally, I think as a lot of, a lot of writers have, but I think that's helped me to work with like other real professionals, you know, I mean, coming out into the world, you know, people who, who, uh, write on the script end of things and, uh, uh, the other things that I didn't work with until later, like dramaturgs and things like that, people who, you know, evaluate your work and want you to keep your facts straight and keep your history you know accurate and stuff like that um and this shows that a lot of that um and it's been it's also been good because i've you know we got produced at good speed when i was 25 and um everybody i've worked with so far has has definitely had like a decade on me in the professional world and that was um that was really clutch you know i mean just to to um kind of absorb some of their energy of, of having done these kind of things before and um, to stay relaxed while you're under pressure and stuff and while that clock is ticking down all the time for opening night and, and stuff like that it's it's been really helpful to be around some people who are kind of seasoned veterans of, of the industry nice so when was the first what, was, what year was it that it, the first idea was conceived and then at what point um how how long after did you get it on its first reading or on its feet um i mean we in 2010 we started in in class at ball state and by the end of that semester like we we had a, a reading of a full show um yeah it was it was insane i think there were like 18 pieces of music um in that one and uh I mean, I had a great uh, teacher named Beth Turcott who kind of like after that part was done, she continued to foster it. So, I mean, we kind of kept doing readings like every, I mean, had to have been every three or four months we were doing a reading. I mean, by the time I was out of school, like I felt like every everybody in the theater department at Ball State had done a reading of the circus in winter. I mean, like we just kept pulling in different people and and not trying to you know, if one kid was good at the role, at a certain role, like, you know, not keeping them in it, making sure that it was a thing that like that performance was something that everybody could put down and it didn't rely on one person's talents to make it work. Uh, so she was really amazing in that, in that regard. And, um, I think it got into the NAMPS festival in 2012. Um, and that went really well. And I believe that's where we were connected with good speed. And, um, shortly after, you know, we agreed we agreed on a contract to do it up there in 2014 and that cast was um was a really tight-knit bunch and um and uh yeah i mean it's been it's been a good time and i mean think things have changed you know on the on the creative end i mean just like our our team has shifted around a little bit and definitely our story has changed like i said with the times like we've kind of reevaluated like where our core story sits um, kind of in the zeitgeist right now and what's important and what people what stories people need to hear and and how uh our stuff that we've already written cross paths with uh with that but uh, i think we're still doing good work on it 
What was that like to get it into NAMP? Because I, I know like hundreds and hundreds of shows, you know, apply for that and it gets de- whittled down to like six or something. Yeah, like it's like that. it's like six or eight or something. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you? Because I'm I'm on the, the NAMP website and I'm looking at some of the, the cast members and, and, yeah. and, and things like that. So I'd love to know that experience. Uh, I mean, that was a rush. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's just so funny to look back on um, at this point because like Sutton Foster was a mentor in, in college and um, she ended up being, you know, gracious enough with her time to come in and do that. Like it was a 45 minute cut of the show. And so, I mean, having her in it, like, yeah. you know, all of a sudden we're just, we're just sold out like, like in a second. Um, yeah. So that was, you know, still trying to wrap my mind around the fact that that happened, but um you know, also like other other great performers like Kate Rockwell's in that and uh, Steel Burkhardt, I think. And uh, I mean, met a guy who played guitar for me there. I mean, it was it was that was also, you know, while we're on this was I had been playing the guitar and, and like kind of music directing the show. Out of college and into the real world, you know, every single time. So like I had never actually sat in a seat and watched the show um because i was always playing guitar for it and trying to give give cues i'm not a music director mm-hmm. but i sure acted like one there for for three or four for three or four years and um so i mean yeah the fellow eli zoller who played guitar for that very first um uh reading there at NAMPS, like i mean he's become a friend we just went to a mets game two days ago you know and i mean that's been over 10 years now we've been or going going on 10 years now we've known each other and then uh you know kate is um managed now by the same person who's best friends with uh with my girlfriend d rossioli and stuff and so it's just it's just funny how that yeah. uh NAMPS situation kind of kind of it all keeps coming coming around and stuff so I think it really was a, a big uh jumping off point for me and it was uh and it's also funny to look at that because like I with all the actors I hang out with you know whenever they're doing a NAMP thing it's kind of like oh yeah I'm gonna do NAMP this year you know it's it's such a small little yeah. 45 minute thing and at the time for me it was just like the it was the whole universe you know in, in 45 minutes and um yeah. so yeah it's 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 great to look back on and that was a special time and it's and that's a great program i think i, I gotta get back there i gotta give them something something else here <laughs> well I, i'm a member of NAMP now so i'm gonna hopefully get down there in october and see all the new ones and all right yeah you gotta elbow them for me yeah i'll see what i can do yeah how i wield yeah <laughs> you might want to find somebody else then yeah <laughs> I do have a curious question because you mentioned that you were music directing it uh, the entire time and then you, you stepped off and you were sitting in the, okay, well, yes, they can't yeah. see the air quotes, but yeah. <laughs> music I directing. was like, this song goes like this. <laughs> nah. And then you said you were sitting in the audience. Is that something that's easy for you to, to hand over your stuff to somebody else? Or do you, are you the type of person that goes, this is, I, I kind of don't, I, you give it away from, um, you know, with difficulty. It's not easy for you to let go. Over time, I think it's been it's been the thing that I I think is most important about theater um, is to because um, when people in college, it's like everybody's learning, you know, everybody was learning and stuff. So it's like I would really have to be like, you know, it goes like this and you just have to sit next to the person and and, and not that there's any problem with that. Everybody is where they are. Yeah and kind of guide people through. So I felt like I was a lot more hands-on back then just because like more of the show was inside of my brain at the time. But um, I mean, my my MD that I'm with right now, my music director that like I use most often is, is just this wonderful guy and this just, just giant of a talent named Matt Hinckley, who's who's kind of been associate on um, a lot of things uh, Michael Raptor works on and, and he, he works with Sutton as well a lot of times and, and of course you know music directs a ton of stuff all around the country and uh he's proficient on uh guitar and piano so for me he's just the best crossover and a great guy one of my one of my great friends and um giving my stuff to him uh to teach people uh is i just don't worry about anything at all the only thing i really worry about is making sure that i've given him enough of 
um, you know, a good enough recording or like, or like, you know, uh, uh, arrange my sheet music in a way that it really tells the story of how the song goes, that there's no like guesswork or, or uh, there are no, there are as little choices as possible where like, I'm kind of like, it's either going to be this, or the, you know, if I make a call, then he's going to get it and uh, put it down. And from the acting perspective, um, I just have been just so fortunate to deal with people who really um, see the value in the stuff that I put down and and um, and embrace it and get enthusiastic about it. And when that happens and everybody's kind of happy um, with the stuff they're doing and um, you get to that special place where you can feel like, as opposed to me writing a good song and somebody performing my good song, you know, it becomes a thing where I wrote a good song, they brought a good performance and uh, we all accomplished something to get together. And that's, that's, you know, like the, the utopia of the whole thing. And so it, it becomes the most essential part of the process, I think, to give it to somebody else, because then it doesn't even feel like yours anymore. That's, that's something that they can take with them. And it wouldn't be what it is without them doing the job that they've done. So um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of become the thing turned turned from the thing that scared me the most at the beginning to the thing that that I think is the most magic about about doing this job. Yeah. And and I'm glad you said that stuff for for people who are listening that yeah, it's it what we create is born to go off on its own. You know, we can we can only coddle it and take care of it for so long, but it's yeah. to live somewhere else and and whatever happens to it, it you know, you don't have control and and sometimes it's exciting and sometimes it's terrible <laughs> whatever you yeah. see you know when it goes off on its own but yeah. you know that that's life so so speaking of it going off on its own it went to good speed like you said mm-hmm. how, how was that experience um and how much of it did it change from from the NAMT it's 45 minutes to good speed was there a lot of rewrites a lot of changes or did it essentially kind of move over yeah there was a lot of rewrites and, and changes for sure um I mean we kind of we kind of tried out a couple different concepts. I mean, this is kind of what happens when you when you have a book that's um that's so big. I mean, you can pick and choose what you want to pull from and and you know, kind of try on an outfit as it were, you know, with the story. And um and so we we did a lot of that. And um it's uh yeah, I mean, I mean new new characters and stuff like that. I mean characters that have come and gone since that production, honestly. Um but uh, I mean, I said earlier, it's a really tight knit group and, um, it's still kind of, still kind of is. I mean, I, I, I still hang out with a lot of the people went to a bachelor party of the guy who was essentially the lead a couple of weeks ago. Like, and I really tried for a long time to, um, you know, uh, I was 25 when that thing got produced and I tried really hard to like, you know, don't go out to the bar with these people, you know, just like, like. Be, be kind and courteous, but don't get too close while they still have to do the things that you need them to do, you know, and, and I thought that was good advice, but after the show was over and after we had, you know, such a great bonding experience and stuff, like I, I started hanging out with all those people and, and I still do it. They're, they're fantastic. Um, and, and I think we've all been bonded from that experience and it's such a great environment up there, good speed. I mean, I, I think I've been back to good speed, like four or five times on different writing retreats. And then me and D of course, were just up there last month, uh, you know, doing a, doing a show under the tent outdoors for all the, the audience they have there. But, um, it, it, the show was definitely its own. There's definitely a good speed version and, and, uh, in the archive of what the show is that, that we look at a lot of times and, and, uh, for, the version we're working on right now, yeah, it was nice to kind of go back. We picked like two or three songs from Good Speed that we'd left behind. And then, uh, you know, somebody really recently, this song specifically called The New Day, where they were like, you know, maybe you could reformat this song to do this and this and this job, you know, at this point of the show. And so that felt good. It, it, it takes you back to that production. So what's next for the, for the, the, the show? Uh, where does it go from here? Well, we're writing right now. It's kind of been a three-person team during the pandemic. Um, well, I mean, five, five total, but creatively, it's uh, myself, um, my good friend Joe Calarco, who directed the Good Speed production, has now 
kind of switched gears and I'd always kind of wanted him to uh, help me craft the story and, and write it. Um, so he's stepped into that role. He's been great at it. Um, we are wrestling kind of with an outline, a very detailed outline, uh, just trying to get everything together before we actually like write this thing. So we've kind of been on a, a six month plan and uh, we've also been working with a uh, wonderful woman named Sybil Roberts, who teaches at American University, and she's been our dramaturg uh, for this to kind of, kind of go through, you know, the details of everything. And uh, we have two producers that have that have been kind enough to invest in us, uh, Claire Buffy and Blair Russell. And uh, it's been, you know, just like a Zoom crew, going through and writing together. And I've I've written uh, a number of new things, and I'm really happy with them. Um, working i'll be working you know tonight i'm going down to um st louis in the morning to see my girlfriend at smoky joe's cafe and the mute at uh, the muni and um we have a zoom meeting on friday so everything's got to be done here by wednesday night so right when i'm done with you i'm uh <laughs> i'm heading right over to to logic pro to uh to bang out these last two songs that uh that i've written but it's um it's it's been it's been great to to have the show during uh, during this this kind of life on pause moment we all have gone through um, to kind of take you out of this world and into another world and um, and and tell us a little bit you know I think I think the story's involved in the present day more than it ever has been and it's been nice to kind of take the things that we think are important about the way the world is changing and and, and cement that into this story a little bit um so it's been good i have i have some pre i'm feeling pretty good about it having high hopes you know congratulations ben on, on the journey of the show and and where it was and where it's going and i look forward to seeing it on stage again at some yeah. point in the future me too, me too. thanks um, well, before we go, I, I, I want to ask three questions. I asked three questions of my guests. There's no right or wrong answer, mm -hmm. but we may judge you on the third answer. Okay. Just give you a heads up on that. <laughs> so, question number one, um, what creator or team within musical theaters had a great influence on you? You know, it could be a composer, a lyricist, a director, producer, actor, stage manager, even it could be somebody famous or not famous, like a teacher. Is there anybody who's um, had a good influence on you? Um, from a writing perspective, uh, I, I, you gotta, I gotta say Sondheim because I mean, it's just like, um, I feel like that's the basic answer, but, uh, it's, but it's true. You know, I mean, I specifically with, uh, Sweeney Todd is, is my favorite musical ever. Um, I had just never seen something like that. I didn't know that you could that, that musicals could be that way. So, I mean, I remember seeing a, seeing a high school do that when I was like 16 years old and just, I, I had no idea that that was possible. But then as I got older, you know, Jason Robert Brown creeping in there and then Adam Gettle, I'm a big, big, big fan of uh, all the things that are going on there. But um, personally, you know, I have to, I mean, I have to say Sutton, like, I mean, Sutton, uh, just in her, her creative approach, I feel like, you know, at the time where um, I really got to spend a lot of time with her, uh, she was in this place where uh, her, how do I say that? I feel like, I feel like I got to spend some time with her where she was in a place where she uh, wanted to perform things the way that she felt most comfortable. Um, I feel like she was at a time where she would, she was embracing the idea that she can put any song. She had she had come far enough and become such a thing that she she felt like she could do any song she wanted any way she wanted, and it was really cool to uh, kind of observe her uh, uh, doing a concert where like I essentially opened for her and and seeing the way that she was changing her act and. Uh, she's so great and so creative that way and so that way and um then a big mentor for me coming up to school was also uh john cariani um talked a lot with me about um just the idea of, of writing that line of being a performer but also being a writer because he's just spectacular at both and um so i mean it's it's been great to uh to know him 
uh, over time and talk about, you know, just start, I, I was thinking about him the other day because he said, uh, you know, anytime I'm acting, I'm really skinny and I'm really fit. And he said, and anytime I'm really actually writing, you know, I'm, I'm putting on 20 pounds because that's all I do is eat. And I feel like anytime I'm, I'm writing too, I think, I think he may have cursed me and gotten me into snacks while I write <laughs> or something like that. But um, that's the way it is. Your belly gets big the longer you write. Um, and uh, so he's, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy too. And too many teachers to count. Had a, had a great, had a great theater director in high school. Who I just talked to a couple of days ago and he's just still the best. Chris Bundy is his name. And then, um, you know, kind of my second mom at school was Beth Turcott, who was the one who was like, I think he can write a musical. I said, we'll see. And she was right. She's right about most things still. And uh, Bill Jenkins, my department chair, a million, a million teachers at Ball State, um, who had a lot of patience with me and the weird and the weird animal that I am. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Good question. All correct answers. You can't go wrong with any of those. So uh, one point, which means nothing, but one point anyways. Um, <laughs> question number two, um, have you ever encountered your own elephant? You know, the, the, that elephant that changed your life? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably, probably the show. I mean, I think that's been the, the wild cosmic uh, idea behind, uh, behind the show. You know, you see you, the idea of seeing an elephant and, and it changes your life and you don't think of the world the same way it's it's probably it's probably that way it's been a weird one um you know i mean the lead in our show at good speed was d rossioli and um i you know like i said i didn't hang out with anybody exclusively at all and then like you know two years after that show was over we ran into each other at a party and got to talk and I went on a date and now it's like, we, you know, we've been dating each other for like six years. So it's, it's just a weird, a weird kind of thing. It's like, right. When I started getting involved in circus and winter, it, it led to my wider career and, and my, you know, what's kind of just become my day-to-day -day life. It's, yeah. it's pretty wild. So it's, I'd have to say that. Very nice. Correct answer. Another point. <laughs> Very good. All right. Number three, which we may judge you on. Okay. Food in the theater or cell phones in the theater, which is worse? I'm going to say food because of, of just the, the kind of thing. Oh, wait, are we talking about the audience? Yes, not on stage. <laughs> oh, so, cell phones. So, okay. Cell phones, a million percent. I was thinking like rehearsal. I was like, you oh. know that one? <laughs> I was like, you know when somebody brings that one kind of Subway sandwich yes. with the onions? <laughs> unforgivable in the rehearsal space in the audience <laughs> yeah just so many people haven't gotten the memo and it's never it's not so much um i don't feel like i hear uh cell phones going off as mm -hmm. much but you're just sitting there you're doing your thing on stage you're in your moment and then all of a sudden you just see like somebody's face light up yeah <laughs> like you just see it grabs your attention somebody basically looking at the floor and and their face is just illuminated yeah. by, their, by their smartphone. <laughs> yeah, that can that can go away. I like going to the concerts where like, have you ever been to one of those concerts now where they take your phone and they they lock it away no. and you pick it up at the end? <laughs> I went to like a like I saw a pretty big comedian perform and yeah. um, actually it's been, it's been twice. I've seen a folk singer who's doing like a really intimate like acoustic only thing in a very big space. Yeah. And yeah, before you went in, they were like, give us your phone. They put, they lock it in a little baggie and they gave you the ticket. It's like coat check for your phone. Wow. And they were great experiences. I was like, look at this. Yeah. Everybody's paying attention. It's almost like we're experiencing it together. Wow. What, <laughs> what a concept. So yeah, right, cell phones, the worst. Turn it off. I would have also accepted they're both terrible, but I'm giving you an extra point for the rehearsal hall of the thing. No one's ever mentioned that before, and that is awesome. <laughs> so Stink, nothing like a stinky sandwich. <laughs> Did that actually happen to you? Is, is oh that, yeah. You yeah. have to know what I'm talking about. That one Subway sandwich, like the French onion one. It like <laughs> a full radius of a mile. You can tell when somebody's eating one of those. Oh, that's too funny. Th four points out of three questions. Congratulations. You thank you. You thank you. There is no prize, but it's the honor of getting four out of three. I feel honored. I, I appreciate you. it. Awesome. Ben, again, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and talking to us today and telling us about the circus in winter. 
Thank you so much. I'll have to get up there at Canada so we can we can sit down and, and uh, see each other again after this is all done. It's been a pleasure. Please do, please do. All right, we were just speaking with Ben Clark, the lyricist and composer to the musical, The Circus in Winter. Tune in next week as we'll speak with another guest or guests about their life, love, and passion that is musical theater. I am your host as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff, and until next time, I'll see you when I see you.